The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Improving Outcomes for Patients with Refractory Rheumatoid Arthritis, The Role of Jack Inhibitors. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at www.peerview.com forward slash MJP. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hello, this is Dr. William Rigby from the Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth in Lebanon, New Hampshire. Welcome to this educational activity focused on unmet needs in rheumatoid arthritis care and the impact of JAK inhibitors on patient outcomes. Joining me in this discussion is Dr. Greg Silverman from the NYU School of Medicine in New York City. Greg, it's great to have you here. Thank you, William. Glad to be here. So later today, we will also be joined by a patient of mine, Chris Donnelly, who will share his perspective on living with rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis is a chronic systemic inflammatory disorder of unknown etiology that primarily involves synovial joints. I'm always struck by the synovial joint inflammation and its relationship to systemic inflammation. And those conduits or those interactions seem quite mysterious to me. What do you think, Greg? Well, there is something very special about synovial joints and even more so the distribution of the peripheral joints that are involved by rheumatoid arthritis. It's one of the most common question, why these joints and not those joints? DIPs are not involved, but PIPs and MCPs and wrists are so prominent. Other joints can be involved, but so variable. But it's all about the personality of this idiosyncratic disease. And what's uh, recognized is that this disease can start or have footprints, immunologic footprints and autoantibodies that are present five to 10 years before they ever have any, any inclination or any hint of any have, of joint pain, don't you think? Yeah, it, it seems quite interesting that it, it starts out very diffusely, antibodies in your bloodstream, and only at some later time, and we don't know what triggers it, does it settle into the joints and particular joints leading to inflammation, joint destruction, and bony erosions. Yeah. You know, it's so, um, it's almost ubiquitous in the population. It's like somewhere between one in 100 and one in 300 people in the United States suffers from rheumatoid arthritis. And so that means that number of patients are carrying around inflammatory disease, which is causing joint pain, but is also causing uh, problems elsewhere in the body, such as the cardiovascular uh, uh, system. It's, it's something that we should never underestimate that although the joints are involved and we need to address the signs and symptoms and help people uh, become more functional and get their disease under control, a diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis part and parcel is associated with decreased life expectancy of 10 years or more, most likely or most often due to the cardiovascular effects, but also there's increased incidence of lymphomas. And so it's all a big package, and a, not a great package, but the implications go beyond the joints. Yeah. You know, I'm always struck by when I do the review of systems with patients with rheumatoid arthritis, how often they talk about having dry eyes and dry mouth, the so-called SICA complex that associates with this disorder, which further underscores that this is a systemic disease that has multiple targets and affects our quality of life in multiple ways other than our joints. And of course, in fatigue, a major symptom, and all these together affect the quality of life. People really have reduced functionality uh, I found in many patients, as you know, morning stiffness is very, very prominent. And in some patients, you can gauge how well they're doing with their therapy with how long that morning stiffness uh, lasts. Sometimes people very severe, three or four hours. They take a shower. That doesn't really help. They can't even get out of the house. Uh, but if you're doing well, if therapy is helping, uh, then it's just a few minutes. You know, I've found that the foot involvement with rheumatoid arthritis is really seems to be a a uh, real killer for some of my patients. When they get up and walk to the bathroom in the morning, they're dreading every step. Mm. They feel like they're walking on uh, fire, and they just uh, really hate to put pressure on their feet. And then, as you said, with time, and eventually they warm up and this pain eases off. Yeah, never to be uh, underestimated. Uh, often in the clinic, we don't have time to, for people to take their shoes off, but that may be what's limiting in uh, people's uh, mobility and quality of life. If you really can't get up and walk that block to get to the supermarket or whatever, uh, things are, can be really dire. And on another note, 
Uh, it's very important to take good care of your feet. I live in New York. People pound away with every step on concrete. I don't think this is how we evolved, and I think we need to uh, think about our patients' shoes as well. Yeah. That's actually, uh, you, with practice and with experience, we pay more attention to these things, such as arch supports and other things. So let's talk more, a little bit more about the, what our rheumatoid arthritis patients start to experience when they develop the joint pain. What do you think uh, is the biggest challenge for a rheumatoid arthritis patient that uh, comes in to see, a, see his family practice doctor or his generalist or his PCP with joint pain? Well, often when people first present, their symptoms are they can't even get through the day, they can't even dress themselves. Uh, this phrase, this euphemism, activities of daily living, this is can you do your buttons? I mean, I have problems with these buttons myself, uh, or opening jars, uh, or uh, even combing your hair, all of these things can be very, very limiting. Uh, and there are many other ways that rheumatoid arthritis can affect your quality of life. Right. I find our f uh, family practice docs and our primary care doctors are really on the front line seeing people every 15 minutes trying to get everybody sorted out. And then finally, when they have a rheumatoid in their office, then having to uh, negotiate the referrals pattern to get them in to be seen quickly. We have a three-month backup here at Dartmouth, and I know that we can't, we're can't. we trying to figure out strategies to bring them in early. Is this something you see in New York as well? Absolutely. This is a very common problem, and there's always a trade-off between uh, whether or not a, a referral is really for a disease that a rheumatologist is needed to care for, and you have to do a certain level of triage. But one way or another, over time, we better understand the pathogenesis of the disease, we have better therapy, and I think we're convinced that earlier intervention will result in better outcomes in the long term. You know, I think that's absolutely true. In my career, uh, you know, in my career since I started practicing in 1985, the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis has changed so dramatically. I remember about a third of my patients were in Walker or some other uh, assistive devices and it was on the second floor of a uh, hospital, and I always thought about how hard it was for them to get up to see me. And now I, it's so uncommon to see this. If I see people with assistive devices in my, my practice, it's usually for some other reason unrelated to rheumatoid arthritis. So our therapies have really advanced tremendously. What is your general approach to uh, a new onset rheumatoid arthritis when you see somebody in the clinic? What do you, how do you approach them, and what do you tell them about... Uh, what they should ex expect. Well, so let me just contrast that. I think we are completely contemporaries. And in the 80s, uh, the, the, we were much more careful, and we often watched people with repeat visits for two or three months before we even started methotrexate. And that's because we were worried that we would make the wrong diagnosis. Uh, I think that the, uh, the 2010 criteria, the ACR ULAR criteria, uh, really brought us more up to date. The earlier criteria involved things like rheumatoid nodules and erosions, and we know that that's really associated with disease of many years duration where the damage has already been done. Now we want to make the diagnosis as soon as possible. The 2010 criteria, as you know, there is no duration of disease and symptoms that are required. You can theoretically diagnose somebody if they developed symptoms yesterday, they have the characteristic joint distribution, and again, it's primarily a clinical diagnosis supported by the number of joints, small joints, the right distribution. Inflammatory markers are supported but not required, as well as autoantibodies. You can still have seronegative rheumatoid arthritis, but we're, we have greater confidence because of the specificity of things like antibody to citrullinated protein antigens, the ACPAs, and the specific tests that are CCPs. That really has such a higher specificity, few false positives, and rheumatoid factors, that classic uh, test, although it can be positive in other conditions, is very supportive. You know, I tell people now that in the history of mankind, they could not get rheumatoid arthritis at a better time. And, uh, <laughs> this and is a good news, bad news it, <laughs> story. <laughs> exactly. And so one of the things I really make the point of is that, I, is that, as you were alluding to, is that the diagnosis now in seropositive disease can be made very quickly and very efficiently, which allows you to move on to the issues of treatment. And that allows you to introduce the concept of methotrexate, which many people have been afraid of. And then, uh, you, then they often say, well, what's the likelihood of having a great response to methotrexate? And I say, the likelihood of a great response, meaning drug, uh, meaning a remission, 
that has no symptoms is probably about somewhere between 25 and 30 percent at one or two years. Mm -hmm. And then they say, what about the other 75 to 80 percent, Dr. Silverman? What do I do about that? Well, and uh, we use, of course, the uh, touchstone is methotrexate. If we don't have an adequate response, and I think implicit to this is the idea of treating the target, and that means really having some kind of measure of clinical disease activity, joint counts. There are a number of different indices that can be used, but it, it is a much better way of following how a patient is doing than just say, how do you feel today versus six weeks ago, uh, will escalate. And the point is that with increasing experience, we don't have to necessarily uh, consider just going on to the uh, TNF inhibitor as the as the first biologic, and of course you can try uh, other conventional DMARDs and a combination regimen. You can really evaluate, does the patient have joint erosions? How, how uh, urgent do we really need to intercede? And put it in the context of patient's comorbidities and individualizing therapy. So I didn't want to just sound that it's a knee-jerk response. You think carefully, uh, but in many cases it may be that you'll try a cytokine inhibitor like TNF-alpha inhibitor of yeah. the different five that are available now in the market. Right. You know, it's 2018, and in 2018, and, uh, and a second drug in the class of the JAK inhibitors, the so-called JAK inhibs, has been approved. And this follows on the use of uh, the, the approval of tofacitinib, which is now uh, an option instead of a TNF inhibitor in the ACR guidelines for patients that have had an inadequate response to methotrexate. These are quite remarkable drugs, don't you think? I think it's really uh, a triumph of rational drug design and, and uh, the whole idea that we went from just beginning to understand inflammation, being able to measure different molecules that reflect inflammation, never really getting a handle on what's dominant, to having corticosteroids, methotrexate, and then targeting individual molecules. And then it was really all about understanding the molecular biology. How does a cytokine actually, these little molecules, how do they really affect individual cells? Understanding their interactions with receptors, triggering this signal transduction cascade, and then having enough cognitive insight and molecular modeling to figure out how to make a tiny little molecule that will diffuse into the cell and interfere with the circuitry and block the ability of the JAK kinase to be phosphorylated and therefore block its ability to signal through staph phosphorylation and affect gene transcription in the nucleus. I think it's really incredible that this has happened in such a quick manner. And one of the things that I find so striking about it is how effective these drugs are and how quickly they work. And one of my ideas about thinking about this is that these JAK inhibitors affect signaling cascades, like you said, not just for interleukin-6, but for many different cytokines, interferons, IL-12, IL-23, all over the body, and all the interleukin-2, all these effects that they have are all over the body. And these JAK kinases, JAK1 and JAK2, are in almost every nucleated cell in the body. JAK3 is a little bit more restricted, and it's only in lymphocytes primarily. So we have a drug that when we block JAK1, we're blocking JAK1 in many cells in the body, and the striking thing is how effective doing that has been and how quickly it works with responses, ACR20s in two to three weeks. It's astonishing that an oral agent works that quickly. It makes me think of it's almost like prednisone, 20, giving 20 to 40 milligrams of prednisone, which obviously we can't use, uh, because of, not because of its efficacy, but because of safety concerns. Have the safety concerns bothered you at all with the JAK inhibitors? Well, absolutely. I mean, we always think about the balance of efficacy versus safety, and we always are concerned about uh, what kind of studies and what duration and what kind of doses should be examined before, before we really feel comfortable uh, that we know everything about the safety of an agent. And I have to say there are side effects that will not be revealed in randomized clinical trials because of duration and number of patients. And so we've learned that over time. But to backtrack to where you started, William, uh, just think about, here we have these agents that cut major circuits in cells, not just the bad cells and the bad disease, they permeate into every cell in the body, and that you can actually have an agent that you can define a dose and a regimen, and it has uh, pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, 
that it doesn't actually just turn everything off in your body. Right, isn't that amazing? It is amazing, <laughs> it is amazing, the balance. So, and that really determines, sometimes you can have an agent that is so good that it's bad, on target effects with horrible side effects. Right. This is one of the things that's still amazing to me when you use the JAK inhibitors, is the response rates with a pill you're taking only once a day, and the response rate is, again, is you either say it's working at multiple levels all at once, or it's working a little bit at multiple levels, or it's really sealing off one particular bad pathway that's driving the rheumatoid arthritis. We really don't know which one of those is r related to efficacy here. We certainly expect that safety would be a little bit more diverse in effects, uh, like uh, effects on natural killer cells or lymphocyte mm -hmm. function or mm -hmm. levels might be associated with certain infections. But the long-term, the longest-term clinical data, long-term extension data, so far does not show any new signals, but we might have some uh, eventually. I, I think that's possible, but uh, on another level, these agents are designed to be anti-inflammatory and immunomodulatory. And in a way, if you didn't see some kind of effects on the immune system uh, with regard to defense from infection or reactivation, you'd wonder, how could that be? Right. So the, life is a package. Circling back to methotrexate, when I put patients on a JAK inhibitor, the first thing they want to do is, when can I ditch the methotrexate, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Because, or ditch the prednisone, mm -hmm. because sometimes they really don't feel well. You know, one of the elements of this that I thought was always interesting is the patient reported outcomes with the JAK inhibitors are sensational. Their patients are responding mental health improvement that's very striking. So that fatigue, which I happen to find methotrexate is not particularly effective at eliminating. You can make all the joints look good, you can make them move, you can get rid of the morning stiffness, but some people still tell you they just feel tired. Mm -hmm. And I find the jack inhibitors work well on that element too, pointing to your fact that they're probably working in circuitry all over the body, maybe including in the central nervous system. And I think the, the speed of onset is really such a great advantage because you, if you, you have an agent like a Janus kinase inhibitor where patients will see dramatic changes in most patients, not every patient, but many patients, uh, and the number of joints that are involved in two weeks, they'll remember how they felt two weeks ago. But other agents so slow, it's like, how do you feel now versus three months ago? Right. It's like, I can't remember what I had for this, lunch yesterday. Right, so. right. This, is the, this is the problem with methotrexate, right? People don't, A, it makes some people feel poorly, B, the onset of action is so slow that they lose the identity that the drug is actually doing anything. And this leads to such a low level of adherence with methotrexate. Sometimes it's 40 to 60% of predicted use. Yeah, the, uh, this is the comment where someone says, I don't know if this agent is helping me at all, I just want to stop it. And the way you find out that it was helping them is then they stop it and they go, you know, I think this was really helping me. Adherence is always very important, and I know that uh, from a very young age, I was always impressed by the marketing for one-a-day vitamins. Yes. Just one a day. That sounds great. If we could just take a tablet for anything, just one a day. Right. And uh, that's the advantage of the Janus kinase inhibitors. Yeah. If, so if, you, if you reduce their uh, rheumatoid arthritis therapy to a t pill they take before going to bed every night, compliance and adherence is going to go way up. And that's, uh, I actually think daily medicine is much easier than weekly medicine like methotrexate. And so therefore I'm very, uh, uh, I'm optimistic. I I'm actually would discourage a company from trying to come up with a once a week pill, right? That would, uh, that would be difficult to remember what day of the week it is. Exactly. Yeah, a, so this is the kind of thing that we have to deal with. And I just want to make a comment on something earlier you said about how often we start a Janus kinase inhibitor in the context of methotrexate and low-dose steroids are often used as bridges. Uh, and I think the important point is that to induce a clinical remission generally takes a more strenuous approach than maintaining a clinical remission. Exactly, yeah, exactly. So you can put people into remission requiring combination therapy, but once they're there, you can start pulling drugs right. away and maintain the remission. And uh, patients oftentimes consider that the strongest evidence that the drug has really helped them. Right, and uh, then it may be a challenge after six months, a year, or two years to come to some rational decision tree. How do you decide whether you still need to take that same dose or that same combination? It becomes a little bit ambiguous 
but I have to say that's a much better predicament to be in than uh, grasping for a fit to uh, decide what next drug to take because everything has failed. Yeah. You know, our, t our uh, JAK inhibitors have come in sort of initially for our patients who have inadequate responses to biologics, but now they're moving up in the treatment paradigm. But they've been studied in early disease well. And uh, in early disease, they have profound effects and oftentimes are superior to methotrexate. Do you ever see a day when the uh, JAK inhibitor class will be used as first-line therapy? I think that it's very feasible, of course, you know, what it's approved for in the indication, and it has to do with the safety benefit uh, uh, ratios. I think the other thing that, that we should mention, though, in this context is rheumatoid arthritis, heterogeneous, different between individuals. We know the histology varies, but we have a general impression that the longer that you've had this disease, the more difficult it is to control. Right. And what that really means, I don't really think that, that let's say I have the disease. If I've taken uh, methotrexate, three different TNF inhibitors, and two other biologics, whether it really changes the biology of the disease, I don't know if that's true, but if I have this disease for 10 years, it's very difficult to really turn it off. And in that context, the whole idea that earlier and more effective intervention will have the best outcomes and people will have less joint erosions and have a better quality of life and mu much less frequently become disabled. Right. So I can see that you know, over time, as we have greater confidence in these agents, we'll have confidence that we can in intercede sooner, but of course more information is needed. You know, it's interesting about what you say about long-term disease, because you know, when you do a C-dye or a pa you evaluate a patient, you always have a visual analog scale for them to check off a box on how active they think their arthritis is. And sometimes their rheumatoid arthritis is great, but if they have low back pain, they're gonna nail right. number 10. Or you have prior joint damage, so what you have is a damaged wrist that hurts every time you reach for a to hold your coffee cup. That's going to influence how you feel, and it's avoiding that constant uh, reminder of uh, previous damage that we would love to avoid with early therapy. That's why you have to balance these uh, clinical disease activity indices and there's ceiling effects for some of them and it's it's really uh, even though we try to be very specific you have to sort of take everything with a, a grain of salt. Yeah. You know Greg I was just thinking you mentioned that there are five different TNF antagonists in the marketplace right now. Currently there are two uh, approved JAK inhibitors, tofacitinib and baricitinib, and they're approved worldwide. There are three more that are in development, and some of them are more selective, uh, or allegedly more selective, than tofacitinib and baricitinib. So where do you see us making choices and decisions if we're confronted by five different JAK inhibitors five years from now? Well, I wish I knew what I'll know in five years, so I can tell you that. I, I, uh, as we've had many discussions, I think the differences in the different companies in developing their agents, some have gone for uh, JAK1 selective agents or JAK2, and those that have gone for agents that are less JAK selective. And we really had anticipated that there would be great differences in efficacy, but it doesn't look like that based on the trial data that we have now. So the, then the concept was, well, each of these JAKs, each of these isoforms are preferentially utilized in different of the parallel uh, signaling pathways. So perhaps those that are more selective will have signatures that have to do with specific toxicities. And that seems so logical, uh, but that doesn't seem to be being borne out. Although there may be some evidence that certain agents affect blood levels of certain cell types, it doesn't really it's not clear that they have implications with regard to uh, immunosuppression and susceptibility to infection. So we'll have to see. We need more information. And I think that really speaks to uh, something else that I've uh, learned over time, which is you can learn quite a bit from a properly designed trial, uh, great insight, and you can get primary endpoints uh, that will tell you whether something's going to be efficacious. But sometimes it takes a lot more, many more years of uh, drug exposure in patients for you to know what the side effects are. And sometimes it's only with uh, post-marketing experience that you really see certain signatures that you're not going to see in just a couple of hundred patients. You know, we're talking about rheumatoid arthritis, but these agents are also going to be applied in any inflammatory disease or any immune-mediated disease. And in this regard, 
it's going to be very interesting to see whether the selectivity also may offer an effect in a different system that the different system of disease or model of disease that it would not offer in rheumatoid arthritis. Because as we alluded to, rheumatoid arthritis has so many components. It's got systemic inflammation, it's got synovial inflammation. Some people have lung involvement, some people have salivary gland involvement. So it may be that there are specific effects that will emerge that we can't really see right now. One of the things that uh, just occurred to me as we were talking about drug delivery earlier is that uh, a big direction, I think, with these JAK inhibitors is going to be to going to topicals. Have they, uh, remarkable effects have been shown in uh, baldness and in eczema. And, you can, and I think uh, there's a JAK inhibitor that's sold for the treatment of dermatitis in dogs. And alopecia, autoimmune alopecia. Yeah, so I, I think these drugs are not just going to be in the strictly immune domain. There are going to be other areas where it's going, they're going to have incredible involvement. Yeah, the, the trial design that has evolved for, for rheumatoid arthritis and the evaluation of drugs is an opportunity for the development of new agents. We have, an, we have a better idea of uh, gathering homogeneous patients, dividing them into groups. We have an idea of safety side effect, and we can look at an agent and figure out how efficacious it's going to be in RA, and that will teach us about uh, what properties and what the uh, relative uh, safety is for, for uh, other diseases. It's kind of a portal. Portal is a great word because what it also is with the JAK inhibitors is that your portal is only a 12-week trial. You're in and you're out, and pretty soon we're going to be having uh, markers of response with JAK inhibitors at two to four weeks. So it's this idea of going on methotrexate for three months to find out whether you're going to respond is not is going to be a thing of the past. Patients will go on two to four weeks, maybe have a blood test or have an exam, and then the doctor will say, nope, this is not for you, we're moving on, or yep, this is for you, this is your flight plan, I think you're going to be in a complete remission by week uh, 16. That's it. So that's so fantastic, really, and it's, it's all about finding a uh, effective agent for inducing a complete remission, halting the progression of potential radiographic changes, and uh, getting somebody to a better quality of life and, and getting back to work, which right. is the most important thing, at least the government thinks. Well, people define themselves by what they do and, uh, and what they can accomplish. And I think this is another part of rheumatoid arthritis that is really oftentimes missed, is that, that sense of loss of autonomy, loss of independence, loss of a sense of self. Yeah, helpless and hopeless. Yeah, so it's really great when you can turn people around and make them feel much better. Absolutely. So there may be variations of disease and individuals that will benefit not just from JAK inhibitors in general versus another agent, but maybe from the individual agents. But it, I could also in, imagine that as we learn more and discriminate each of these agents with their selectivities or other properties, that we may start individualizing therapy and be able to assign uh, that one agent might be better for an individual, maybe not just because of efficacy and their own disease presentation, but maybe because they have their own comorbidities. Maybe somebody who has a history of colitis shouldn't get that agent, or maybe somebody who has low platelet levels in general, that's just their baseline, just where their equilibrium point is, they should stay away from others. So there may be a lot of different things that we'll put into our little calculator. You know, one of the side effects of uh, the JAK inhibitors that's been unique to the JAK inhibitors and sort of points to how unbelievably intriguing these uh, JAK inhibitors are, is the frequency of zoster. Right? And uh, it's usually not clinically significant zoster, but the frequency of zoster is clearly increased by all the agents, even with or without selectivity. I think which JAK proves that it does something to your right. immune system. Right. But at the same time, I think uh, maybe the good news about that, it, it heightens our awareness. Zoster is not uncommon increased episodes above a certain age, 50-year-olds, even more than 60-year-olds, and even more than 70-year-olds, people with, uh, with chronic medical problems. So we should be very, very vigilant. And now we have vaccines that can prevent this. And I have to say that one thing you don't want to do is end up with an episode of zoster shingles. And if you're not treated adequately, it can be such a painful experience. But uh, being uh, forewarned is being forearmed, and we do have the tools to decrease the impact. Well, you know, it's, I remember from my fellowship in the uh, 80s that uh, RA patients have a problem with uh, varicella zoster. Their immunosurveillance is impaired. They have a, a higher number of 
these uh, viruses floating around. Uh, it's a limited number, but we've always known that there's something odd about the disease and how we deal with chronic infection. And then here we have a new agent, and then all of a sudden it blossoms at three times uh, more frequent rates. Uh, so it teaches us something, and I, maybe it'll even teach us a little bit more about the uh, idiopathic basis, uh, the pathogenesis, the uh, etiology of rheumatoid arthritis. Welcome back. Joining us for this discussion is my patient, Chris Donnelly. Welcome, Chris. Thank you, Dr. Regba. It's good to be here. It's so great to have you here and be part of this program because I think we have this wonderful opportunity to learn about how rheumatoid arthritis showed up for you in your very own words. Okay. So for me, the, um, the start, it was progressive. I noticed it starting in the fall of 2016. Um, I had started playing guitar and noticed that my hands felt, uh, they felt swollen, they felt very tight after playing. And the next morning it was, was worse. Um, I attributed it to actually just playing guitar. But then I noticed that as the fall went through the winter, symptoms got worse to the point where um, I was having difficulty standing up for any great deal of time. If I was doing a lot of work around the house, I noticed that after 15 or 20 minutes, um, not only were my arms and hands starting to feel it, but my legs, my knees, and ankles. Uh, it progressed to the point where I figured something had to be wrong. So in May of 2017, I saw my, my local physician. Being a male, I'm rather stubborn about going to see doctors. Uh, but I started thinking that uh, my mom had suffered from rheumatoid arthritis and was thinking about some of the symptoms that she had developed uh, during her life and started thinking, hmm, this may be more than just what I think it is. It's probably time to actually go see somebody. Yeah. And with regard to the guitar playing, I just want to drill down on that a sure. little bit. Was it the strength in your hands or was it the nimbleness or the dexterity? What, what was it? How did it really uh, sure. affect your guitar playing? Um, it, to start with, it was all about dexterity, that the fingers and wrists were, were very tight. Um, they felt somewhat swollen. Uh, it took a lot of playing in order for me to eventually loosen up to be able to start playing. Uh, but as it progressed, I noticed that uh, it would take longer and the symptoms the day after were usually worse. Yeah. Uh, it had reached the point where in the morning I was no longer able to basically ball up my hands into a fist. Um, the left hand, the, the hand that you used for me being right-handed to play, um, I could probably go about like that in the morning and it wouldn't actually close. And it would take most of the day at the end in order for my hands actually to loosen up and actually be able to be, to do my normal work. Right. Now would your hand actually hurt or could you just not make it move? Uh, it was more swollen. Yeah. Um, there was a little bit of pain or puffiness where I would squeeze on the knuckles and, what, and the areas and it would actually feel like there was probably more to it than that. But it was actually just being able to move the hand. Yeah. Does that sound like a typical story, a typical presentation to you, Greg? Well, you know, I haven't really asked my patients systematically what instruments they play, <laughs> <laughs> but I think I may. But, uh, but uh, Chris, I was thinking, though, did you, you started to say something, and I wondered whether you were aware that certain particular joints were involved, because you were talking yes. about it generally, yeah. but so which joints bothered you the most? So for me, it was the middle fingers, and particularly the large joints. Yeah, these are our PIPs that we call mm -hmm. them, but we there have to have go. a name for everything. There you go. Um, so those were the worst. Um, and primarily it was low, it felt localized. That's why I wasn't quick to go to a, a doctor because it felt somewhat localized at, at when it started. Um, so these fingers, um, I've got a finger on this side here that is never straightened out properly, meaning when I put my hand down, it never really straightens. That started uh, really give me a lot of trouble. And then it just basically progressed into my wrists, which really got me concerned because the wrists became extremely tender and the amount of movement I had went down significantly. Right. Right. And you were saying it was worse in the morning. Worse in the morning. When I got up in the morning, it was torturous. Mm -hmm. um, but as I said, as the day went on, the more I used my hands, the more it actually started to loosen up. Yeah. So I think for a long time, I kidded myself that, well, this was natural, I'm just getting older, and right. you know right. that's part of it, it right. until it reached the point where it just wasn't natural. And right. later, uh, your feet started to bother you as well. My feet, my knees, and my ankles. 
Um, I was spending time uh, at the time cleaning out my parents' house, preparing it to sell. And so we were spending a good deal of time just doing that natural work. It was getting to the point where 15 minutes uh, up and moving around became agonizing. And I'd have to sit and take a break, yeah. uh, which again was unusual because I like to hike. Right. And it had, at that time, it had pretty much stopped me from doing out, any outdoor activity. Yeah. Uh, mowing lawns became extremely difficult using a push mower. Yeah. So. Did you try to take any uh, over-the-counter medications to help you with your symptoms? The only thing I was taking was ibuprofen. I would take Tylenol and that was it. And did they help? Uh, early on, it felt like it did. But after a fashion, it, no, it didn't do anything. How many tablets, I'm just curious about ibuprofen, might you take in a day when you were um, trying to help it yourself? Uh, probably, again, I'm a stubborn individual, so probably two to four. Yeah, when it was first introduced, ibuprofen was a prescription medication. Mm -hmm. And our experience is often that it can be very effective to help symptoms, it doesn't change the nature of the disease, but you have to take enough of it mm -hmm. on a regular basis. And it's often the case that people uh, have the right idea, they may take the right medication. Ibuprofen can be very efficacious, just you need to take it regularly mm -hmm. and you need to take a, a high enough dose. But of course, as, as you learned, you need a rheumatologist. You need mm -hmm. something to get at the root of the problem. Correct. Uh, so yeah. I'm curious, you, you, go to, you finally go see the doctor. Mm -hmm. you your stubbornness is finally overwhelmed. Yes. And you go see the doctor and what does the doctor say? So I explained to him the symptoms and being somewhat of an individual who likes to know, know what's going on, I did a lot of research before I went to the doctor, and I thought, okay, these, this looks like a sim symptom of rheumatoid arthritis, what I was going through. So I explained to my doctor, I said, you know, my mom had rheumatoid. Um, this really feels like, from what I've seen online, that it's probably the same thing. His first answer to me was, well, males don't typically get rheumatoid arthritis, so it's most likely not rheumatoid arthritis. However, we'll do blood tests and we'll see what comes back. And lo and behold, the blood test came back and it was positive for rheumatoid arthritis. Yeah. You know, this is something Greg alluded to, is that the referrals for rheumatoid arthritis have really been advanced by the, uh, the uh, uh, uptake of ACPA testing for rheumatoid arthritis. It's made it much easier and it oftentimes drives really quite prompt referrals. How long did you have to wait to get in to see a rheumatologist? Uh, I believe it was a month yeah. after the initial diagnosis. Yeah. It took about a week for all the tests to come back mm -hmm. and there was enough markers at that point that the referral was made. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And let me just interject though. Uh, it's not uncommon for patients say that they went to the doctor and had a rheumatoid arthritis test. And, but it, as, as we know, mm -hmm. it's a clinical diagnosis mm -hmm and the test can be supportive. But just right. as an aside, we wish we had a test where you could just get a finger stick. There's your diagnosis, okay. You go to the bin, right. you go to the window, whatever, where the therapy pops out and yeah. you'll be good by the time you're out of the, out of the sure. building. But it's not so simple. Yeah. The, um, the, the physician commented that there were also symptoms similar to Lyme disease. Yeah. So part of the testing was for Lyme as well. And yeah. that came back negative, yeah. obviously. So. Right, right, right. So you go to see a rheumatologist. Uh, you saw one of my colleagues, I believe, mm -hmm. first. And then what happened? Um, so again, it was a general examination to, again, check dexterity, movement. Uh, at that point, uh, the individual commented that it looked like it was probably rheumatoid. Yeah. Um, based on that diagnosis, uh, several therapies were op offered, uh, a methotrexate um, op option was presented, which was what my mom was on at the time. Um, and then the suggestion was also made about a possible clinical trial. Right, right. And so I did some research off of the information that was provided to me, and I opted for the clinical trial. Right. So uh, Chris is in a clinical trial for uh, the, which uses a JAK inhibitor as well as methotrexate or either or in various combinations. And what was your response to the, you've been in that trial for how long now? I have been in the trial for 14 months. Right. And how fast did you get better when you, were enter, when you started taking the medications? Um, obviously, it's, it's, it's progressive in that you don't notice it from day to day. For me, the light went on probably about six weeks later. Um, I went from not being able to be on my feet for any length of time, for the most part, to doing a six-mile hike in the White Mountains. And at the end of the hike, I actually felt better than my fiance did coming out of the woods. And she has no physical issues. So, so you, of course, you pointed that out to her. 
Absolutely. And how do you feel uh, now? I feel like my old self. I feel no symptoms. I do not feel like I did prior to the diagnosis. Uh, I feel like I have not had any issues at all. I've had no movement issues. Uh, I don't feel any pain, no swelling. Um, the, the, uh, the, the visits that I make uh, to the doctor's office, um, all of the, uh, the various tests on joints come back with no pain, no tenderness. Right. So yeah, I feel fantastic. Um, is there anything you wish uh, could have been done differently in taking care of this problem, or uh, is it, do you feel like um, the healthcare system worked out well for you this time? I don't. Other than my own personal stubbornness, I don't think there was anything that I would change from the point of the meeting my physician and going through the the work with him to start with, and then getting into the clinic and working with them. Uh, the results for me have been about as, it's been more positive than I thought they would actually turn out. And so the really the challenges are the challenges are what do you do when you have a complete remission? Do you do you stay you stay with the hand that you, you were dealt that got you there, or do you modify therapy? And these are issues that we don't know the answers to. Mm -hmm. Is there a, an approach that you take in your patients, Greg, uh, to patients once they're in complete remission? Do you just reassure them and say, we, we've, we've hit you, uh, won the lottery, uh, let's uh, just let's stay with uh, what we're doing. Well, I, I think everybody who's listening in with us uh, can appreciate what's obvious to me, which is much of the success is that you found the right rheumatologist and you got to a, a diagnosis without too much delay and found an agent that works. Now, I just want to add a, a word of caution that there are patients that have, to any agent, an inadequate response and there are those that are primary inadequate responders and those, unfortunately, that are secondary, which just means that for any agent, you could have a remarkable first exposure and then it can wear off. We don't understand why that occurs, so we always have to have in our mind's eye uh, this, uh, we have to be vigilant, reevaluate, make sure that the response is durable, and then think about how to work towards the future. The, all the trials for people that were on, uh, that had, complete remission or clinical remission with TNF uh, agents, when they try to withdraw them, basically the longer that you're off the agent, the more frequent, the greater proportion of people that will flare. So we don't yet know that there are agents that can reproducibly turn off the disease completely and you can go for a drug-free remission. I think that with that in mind, you may be able to discuss and consider decreasing the intervals or uh, drugs and certain dosing or increasing the intervals, I should have said, between giving the doses. I don't think we know that much about the Janus kinase inhibitors, but there are kinds of way of, of modulating therapy. And I think then, even if you wanted to withdraw, let's say, were you on methotrexate as well as the Janus kinase inhibitor? I was, yeah. And are you still on that as well? No, that has been removed. So that's one step where you actually simplify the regimen. You don't need the background agent. Things are good. We wonder whether or not disease is going to flare. And then just think for the future. And uh, implicit to all of this is your apparently great relationship with Dr. Rigby and communication and uh, sharing your experiences and making sure the information goes both ways. Yes. So I think that's important. What to do next? I guess you guys will have to have that conversation over time. <laughs> well, I think uh, getting off methotrexate has been a big win, and I think that's been uh, something, in, and Chris's exam, and like he says, has remained flat normal for a number of months now, and so we're very happy with this. And Chris, you've not had any side effects with the, uh, with the Janus inhibitor. I have not, no. 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 So that's the other thing that we always look forward to. And we were talking earlier about that the frequency of side effects seems to be very low uh, and very acceptable. And we're just waiting to see uh, for the long term how things people do. Right. And why mess with success? Right. <laughs> right. So, so no, it's, it's been pleasant. And I'm most, most happy about where things have turned out. And that will end our discussion for today. So thank you again, Greg and Chris, for your insights. We hope you found the activity useful, and you can take the information we discussed back to your practice to further improve the management of rheumatoid arthritis in the context of an evolving treatment landscape and patient-centered approach to care. Thank you for participating.
This activity has been jointly provided by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at www.peerview.com forward slash MJP. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Lilly.